Welcome back to Round Trip Death. Before we get started today, I want to talk about personal beliefs. I think there's always something new to learn from our guests. I also realize we all have different belief systems. This show is not about my beliefs or what a religious or philosophical expert would say is right or wrong. This is a judgment-free place where we listen to sincere people describing what happened to them. If something said doesn't fit your personal beliefs, it's okay. How you use this discussion is up to you. My only recommendation is to listen to that soft voice inside you. It'll help you know what to do with this information. Now let's hear from today's guest. We have with us today, Tony Sicoria. We're very happy to have you, Tony. How are you? Great, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Did I pronounce that okay? Perfectly. All righty. Good. Hey, uh, I had fun talking with you the other day and in our pre-interviews that we do. I think your story is very unique, and that's one of the fun things about this show, is that no two NDE stories are the same. No. People kind of assume they are. They're not. They are all different. Yours is one fits into that different category, and it's a whole lot of fun. Before we jump in, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself? All right. Um, I grew up in upstate New York. And I went to the Citadel, which was a military school in Charleston, South Carolina, for college. Um, this was during the war, and I thought if I'm going to go, if I'm going to get drafted and go to war, I might as well go as somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, turned out the war ended a month before graduation, so I didn't get to go anyway. I assume we're talking the Vietnam War here. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then uh, I went to graduate school because I had wanted to, I thought in, in my mind's eye that I was going to be one of these um, crazy mad scientists in the basement of some building uh, doing crazy kinds of research. And I did do that and realized that that wasn't what I wanted. And so after I finished my doctorate, I went to medical school and in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, met the medical university there and, and then decided to go into orthopedics, did my training up in Virginia and um, at the university there, and then went into practice up in upstate New York again, a couple miles from where my, my family grew up, and that was in Oneonta, New York. And I was there... You know, that's we lived there from from the time we moved up there in 1988 until we, we left in 2019. So I've been a practicing orthopedic surgeon um, since 1988 uh, in that area. And it's, you know, I had been going down kind of an academic road. I was, I was doing a lot of research and I was thinking about going into academic research at Syracuse University, but um, things took a turn in my life, and I never I never followed through with all of that. And that turn came about when when I had the um, what I what I will frequently refer to as a phone call from God. Um, it got struck by lightning in 1994. Okay, let's get a little bit of background on that now. So, where were you? What were you doing? And what was your relationship with Lightning before this? We were um, in in August of 1994. Um, every August, my wife and her family would have a big, huge gathering. Um, kind of, a, there were five people that had birthdays in August, so they would celebrate it at one time. And this was that month. We were going to have it at a place called Sleepy Hollow Lake, which is just south of Albany, New York. They had rented a, a pavilion, and you know we went there that morning, and I was in charge of um, running the barbecue. So I was outside, and and it, in the morning it was a beautiful day. I wasn't paying attention to anything because I was running the grill, and about halfway through the morning, I. I decided that I was going to go call my mom, who was not there. And as I 
Yeah, I had to walk around to the front of the building where there was a payphone attached to the building. And so I, um, I'm not paying attention to the fact that a big storm had blown up over the lake, which we were right next to, and I was completely oblivious to that. And as I, you know, dialed my mother, she didn't answer the phone, so I was I was just getting ready to hang up the phone, and I got the phone to about here, and I heard a loud crack. And at the same time, this huge flash of light came out of the phone and hit me in the face. And it just sent me flying backwards. And like I'd been kicked by a horse. And as I was going backwards, a really strange thing happened because all of a sudden I had the sensation of, of moving forward. And I remember thinking, this is crazy. I know that I got hit and I know that I got thrown back and and now I don't understand why I had this weird sensation of moving forward. And that was only for a fraction of a second. And and at that point, I was just standing there absolutely dumbfounded. I'm, I'm looking around and I see the phone dangling from the phone carriage and it's just banging against the wall. And I'm, I'm looking around and and nothing's making any sense to me. Um, and then all of a sudden, I, I hear my mother-in-law screaming, and she's at the top of the stairs, and I'm at the bottom. And she starts running down the stairs right at me, and I'm thinking, well, is it not good when your mother-in-law is screaming and running at you? And I was just kind of frozen like a deer in the headlights. And as she got down right in front of me, it's like I wasn't even there. And she took off to her left. And so I, I just instinctively turned to follow her, and I took a few steps, and suddenly I was confronted with myself on the ground. And and I remember thinking, oh shit, I'm dead. And it was a shock. I mean, I, I you know, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but That's amazing how much can run through your head so quickly. Oh, it was blazingly fast. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm, you know I, I walked over to the body, and I'm realizing that, you know, I'm sitting, I'm here, and I'm, my brain is racing. My, my, my mind was racing, not my brain. And my mind is racing like crazy, and I'm trying to make sense of this. And I see this lady who was standing behind me, waiting to use the phone. She starts to get down to do CPR. It turns out she was a nurse who was just waiting there in the wings to to use the phone. And this place is in the middle of nowhere. I, I can't imagine why she was there. And so she starts to she starts to get down to do CPR and, and I'm trying to call to them and and I realize that they can't hear me. But I can hear and I see them. And I thought, well there's no point in standing around here so I decided to leave, and I turned around, and I was going to walk up the stairs, and I was going to go back to where my family was and see what they were doing. And so I started walking up the stairs, and I'm looking down at the stairs like I normally would, to, just so I don't trip and fall on my face. And as I'm watching the, the stairs, I see that my legs are starting to dissolve. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really getting kind of crazy. And by the time I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form. And I, I just I looked at myself and I was just a, a a ball of energy without without real form. And then the stairs actually go up to the left and I didn't go up the stairs, I just passed through the wall. And when I came out the other side, I passed immediately over my my wife who was sitting on a chair and she's painting children's faces. And I made a specific note to myself of of where the kids were and who they were um, and what position everybody was in. And then they, I passed through that room on kind of on a diagonal. And when I got out of the building, then things really started to get interesting. It was almost like I had fallen into a river of pure positive energy. And it was crazy. And it had this bluish-white light. 
And the only thing that I could feel was if, if you could imagine absolute love and peace. There wasn't anything else to be felt. And at, at that point, I was I was really dumbfounded. Did you feel like that river of energy was taking you somewhere? I did. Um, I did feel like it was taking me somewhere. As as I was standing there in this river, um, there were a number of things that were going on. One, I was looking at this at this river, and it was actually a a river of of energy, and and it was so specific because I could actually see the lines of the energy. I, I could see the almost a sinusoidal wave form that that was flowing in it. And what was interesting about it was that everything that I looked at was made up of this energy. And I I made the conclusion to myself that this must be what God is. This is the energy of God. Um, and it, and at that point, I realized that I there was a sensation of I was moving and I had both speed and direction. I was going someplace. I just had no idea where. Um, but it was it was an incredible feeling. Um, and as I was doing this, I had this, um, it was almost like a collage of high points and low points in my life that just kind of were there and were, and were gone. That right about this point, I'm coming to the realization that this is the greatest thing that can ever happen to anyone. As I'm in this stream and I'm just kind of uh, almost euphoric about it, and suddenly it was like somebody flipped a switch and I was back in my body and I was so angry. I, I didn't want to go back and I was begging anybody that would listen to it to let me not have to go back and go through this. And it went from being absolutely incredibly blissful to being in pain. And so I'm laying on the floor and and I was, you know, I had a, felt like somebody stuck a poker in my face and and one of my foot where it came out. Okay, before we move in that direction more of what happened after you came back, can can we dig any deeper into what you saw and felt? For example, you said you saw energy. I don't know what energy looks like. N normally, I wouldn't either. Um, as I looked at this light, um, this bluish-white light, it reminded me of, um, as a child, I used to swim in in these big creeks uh, where the water was crystal clear. And if I was down low in the deep part and I looked up, I would see this this light from the sun coming through the water and it had this glistening um, whitish appearance to it. And that's, it reminded me of that. The more I looked at it, the more I could see that this the energy that was streaming toward me was had form to it. And as I as I stared at it more, I could see that I saw these lines within the light. And when I looked at some of the of the background things, like uh, I was was seeing trees and 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 the water of the of the lake, I saw that this energy that wherever it was coming from was actually what made up everything so that everything was made of this energy then you know as we as we have learned from our theoretical physics partners everything is made of energy and but i could see it and and it really hit home to me and i thought geez this is something i could measure it was that palpable so it, it was very clear to me that it was um it was something very important very strong so that was sort of your scientific side of your brain saying, maybe I can measure this. Yeah. Did the scientific side of your brain think of anything else? You know, it was it was very clear to me um, a number of things. One, that whoever we are, we always are. And I learned that when I looked at the body and I realized that I'm still having the same thought patterns that I normally would have. And so I realized that this shell that's on the ground is nothing more than a shell. The real me is the, my spiritual form 
that that I was existing in at that point in time, and that was the real person, if you will. And and so I I made that realization, um, and then as I was out in the in the energy stream, then it became even more apparent to me that that there's so much more to to what we imagine reality to be um, than we have any idea. What do you mean by that? You know, we look at, we see, you know, I, I, I look across the room and I see a bookshelf. And, and so is, the, is what I see reality or is it something that my brain has learned to look at uh, the vibrational frequency of, of an object and it interprets that vibration as something solid? Um, when in reality, it's it's probably mm-hmm. there's no real substance. The reality that we see is is a mirage. It's being interpreted by our brain. Yeah, right. That energy. And you said that you lost form and became sort of a ball of energy. Did you see any other of these kind of beings? No, I was, I was, you know, in retrospect, I was disappointed because, you know, I at the time this happened, I didn't know anything about near death experiences or, uh, or anything like that that other people have had, and in reading a lot of these accounts, you know, people they meet relatives, they see other beings, um, they're they're told things, and I I was disappointed that I didn't get any of that. I almost felt like I'd been shortchanged. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't get your money's worth out of that NDE. You know, it, it was like okay, but you really felt something. Explain a little bit more about what you felt. In in terms of when I was out there and experiencing. Yeah, you mentioned you felt energy and bliss. Yeah, I mean, if you can imagine, there's a there's a thing in science called absolute zero. It's a temperature at which there's no molecular motion. And it's a pure singular state, if you can imagine that. And that's what I liken this this love energy to. It's it was completely devoid of anything else. It was just a radiating energy of love and peace. And it was unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. And it was, it was truly earth-shaking. So, again, I'm ta- I want to talk to the scientist for a second here. You've just mentioned energy and love in the same breath. What, what does that mean? Does that make love more tangible? It t- from, from what I experienced... I truly believe that love is a energy form, and that energy um, obviously radiates from a source. But that love is, but that energy rather is something that everyone can share. All right, let's talk about being slammed back into your body. What happened there? Well, it was not. That was not a pleasant experience because it. I went from being absolutely ecstatic with happiness and to absolutely in pain. It really hurt. And I, I remember lying there thinking, oh my God, you know, this really hurts where I get hit and where it went out. And But I was still unconscious. I, I still couldn't couldn't see, I couldn't talk. Um, and, and, and it seemed like minutes went by before I was able to open my eyes as I knew that when I was back, uh, the CPR had stopped and the lady was kneeling next to me and, and I, you know, st- I, I wanted to say something and, you know, I should have known that I wasn't thinking very clearly at that point. And I looked at her and I said, it's okay, I'm a doctor. And she just laughed and said, well, you weren't a minute ago. <laughs> and I and I felt like I felt like a jackass. I really did. And it was like, oh my god, I'm just going to shut up and not say anything else because what's coming out is really stupid. 
And at you know at that point they called the police, they called an ambulance, and by the time you know everybody showed up, I you know I was I was sitting up and I was talking, and I'm like, well, there's no point in going to the hospital because I know what it's like to go to an emergency room. I'm not going to sit there for six hours waiting to be seen, and and there wasn't any real emergency. I said, you know, you either when you get struck by lightning, you're either alive or dead. There's not much in between. So I wasn't thinking very clearly at that point, and that's obvious. And I opted to to just have my family take me home and see my family doctor, and, um, who we called on the way and told him what happened. And he had me just go right over to his office. You know, they checked me out and said, well, everything looks like it's okay. So I thought, and then at that point, I was like, I was really kind of dumbfounded because I'm like, this is this is too crazy to, to have just been a spurious event. You know, it, in my mind, you know, the, the science brain is going, there's no way that you could figure out the probability of, of an event like this where the lightning hit the building and lost enough of its current. By the time it got to you, it just stopped your heart rather than frying you. And... And then on top of that, you know, that part of my brain is also going, and to make sure that you didn't get completely knocked out of the ballpark, they had a nurse standing there waiting to resuscitate you. And then so I, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, what, how do you figure out the probability of two events like that happening to prevent me from, from not returning? And you know, at that point, I realized, okay, this is not a random event. This is, you know, somebody orchestrated this, and for what? I have no idea. Um, but it was pretty clear to me that um, this was something, this was an event that had some importance to it. Um, but I didn't have any idea what it was at that point. Well, you've had 20 plus years to think about it now. Do you have some of those answers? Um, I have a, I have some. Um, and a lot of it came from, you know, shortly after the, after the lightning, you know, within a couple of weeks, I started having this insatiable desire to hear classical piano music, which was a, a big departure for me because I grew up as a kid of the sixties and there was rock and roll and there wasn't much of anything else. Um, my mother had, had made me take piano lessons when I was seven years old for a year and I, at the end of that, at the end of that year, I promptly quit and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to play baseball and go fishing and do all kinds of other stuff. So that was, you know, and never went back to that. Um, so I never really learned a lot either. Um, so for me to suddenly want to be involved in classical piano was, was a big departure. Um, but it was such a powerful uh, feeling that I actually went to a, um, a music store. I had to go to Albany, which was an hour away, to to find a place that even sold classical piano music. And I went into the store, and when I walked in the door, it's like this a CD of Vladimir Ashkenazi playing his favorite Chopin. It seemed like it jumped out of the off the shelf and ran into my hands. Um, I bought the CD and I started listening to it. And I listened to it nonstop, and I was so taken with it that I couldn't stop listening, and I made everybody else listen, even at work. And very quickly, I realized that it was not going to be enough for me to just listen to this music. I needed to learn how to play. But that was a problem, too, since I didn't have a piano and I didn't know how to play. But it seemed like it was the next day our babysitter called and said, I'm I'm moving out of state, and I had this old upright piano. I was wondering if I could store it at your house for a year. And I thought, well, it's fortuitous. Um, so suddenly, you know, I have this feeling that I have to learn how to play a piano, and suddenly a piano appears. Um, and I, you know, I bought some books on trying to teach myself how to do this, and that and that's where I started. And about three weeks into that, I have a dream. And in this dream, it, the dream was like an out-of-body experience. And, and I remembered 
I'm walking out onto a performance stage and I see myself out on the front of the stage and I'm, at a, I'm performing in a concert hall. And I remember thinking, this is really kind of crazy. And as I, I'm walking up and I'm looking at myself and listening to the music, and by the time I walked up behind myself, I realized that this is not somebody else's music. This is mine. So I listened to the music, and the, the ending had a, a loud crashing ending, and it woke me up, and I, I look at the clock. It's about 3.15 in the morning, and I walked out to the piano, and I tried to plunk out some of the things I heard, but I said, this is stupid. I don't know how to read, and I don't know how to write, so I'm going back to bed. And I did. Um, but from that moment on, whenever I sat down at that piano, the music would, from the dream would start playing in my head. And if I didn't pay attention to it um, and and didn't work on it every day, it would start to play in my head when I didn't want to. And it was a very insistent, you know, almost like a small child, like, pay attention to me. I'm like, okay. So I learned very quickly that every day I needed to to do some work on that music. And I started doing that as I was trying to learn. And I was trying to teach myself initially. And and I remember one day my daughter was playing with one of her best friends. And her best friend's mom came by, came by the house to pick her up. And she heard me banging on the piano. And I was trying to learn what's called a fantasy impromptu. It's a piece by Frederick Chopin. Um, it, it's an advanced piece and way above my head. But, you know, it was one of the things on the CD, so I was, gonna, I was determined I was going to learn how to play it. And she heard me, and then she walked in, and she said, what in the world are you doing? And I said, I said I'm trying to learn this piece of music. I said, but I don't understand because the hands don't line up. And she looked at me and she said, they're not supposed to. It's what's called a polyrhythm. And I thought, I, and I said to her, what's a polyrhythm? And she said, I'm not even going to try to explain this to you. You need to get a teacher. And so at that point, I, she gave me the name of, of a couple of people. And um, the one lady was Sandy McCain, who was the the chairman of the Department of Music at Hartwick College, and I called her and I said, look, I'm trying to, I'm an old dog trying to learn some new tricks, and told her the story in which she'd take me on as a student. And, you know, she had me come um, and audition, if you will, um, to be a student, and, and she said, I'll take you on, she said, but there's only one thing I'm going to insist on, and I said, what's that? She said, you don't play anything else of this magnitude until I tell you that you can because you are learning so many bad things trying to do it yourself. And I said, okay. And, and that's the way we went. She started me at the very beginning. And, uh, and we, we started working two hours every week. And, uh, and that continued... Up from from that time, it was 1998. By that point, and uh, and it continued up until um, when I left New York in 2019. So you've gotten pretty good at the piano. I've gotten reasonably done reasonably well. I mean, I I'm certainly no Horowitz, that's for sure. <laughs> Tell us more about this piece of music that was stuck in your head. Did you get it down on paper? For for many years, it was just constantly being played in my head, and I would I would try to to play bits and pieces of it, and as time went on, I would write down little snippets of it, and I would stuff it in a drawer, thinking someday I'll come back to this. I in two thousand two, I started going to a music camp for adults, piano camp for adults called the Sonata, which is in Bennington, Vermont. And and it's essentially a, a big group of people that are in love with the piano and, and play, they just play that exclusively. 
and it's a week of complete indulgence of of the piano. They have lessons. They have they have pieces that they work on, um, and they have a performance at the end of the week. And I had started doing that in two thousand two, and then in two thousand six. So I met. I would go in once a year in May, and in two thousand six, when I went, the owner's sister, who was Erica, um, Erica Vanderlyn Feidner, Erica was the the number one salesperson at Steinway in New York City. And she had just left Steinway and went to Bosendorf for pianos. And she brought five pianos in for people to play during the piano camp. And she and I had gotten talking about this whole thing with the with the music and the lightning and and she said, you know, there's only one person that can tell the story, and that's Oliver Sacks. And I said, at the time, I didn't know who Oliver was other than that he had written the book Awakenings. And he was a famous person. Um, but Oliver was one of the preeminent neurologists in the world, um, as well as a prolific author. And he was the person that had discovered the, the treatment for Parkinson's. And that was in May. And then a couple months later, I get a phone call from Oliver. Um, and he invites me down to his house in New York City. He says, I'd like you to come down so I can interview you. And I want you to be a patient of mine for a study group I have. And I'm like, sure, why not? So in August of 06, I went down to Oliver's house and got to spend a whole day with him, which was incredible. Um, for me. And one of the things that came out of that is as we're standing in the doorway saying goodnight, he looked at me and he had this way of his piercing look. It's almost like he looked right through you. He looked at me and he says, you know, the music from the dream went through an awful lot of trouble to get here. The least you can do is write it. And at that point, I was so taken with what he said that as soon as I got home, the first thing I did was I bought a program called Sibelius, which is writing music for dummies. And it allows you to to play something um, into a recording piano, and it turns it into music um, in notational form. So it was very useful for me, and I spent the next seven months taking all the music that I had heard and converting it into hard copy, um, if you will. And so I, at the end of that seven months, um, I finished it and I took it to my piano camp and I played it for everybody and said, you know, this is the music from the dream that I've been hearing nonstop ever since it happened. It was well received. And while I was there at the camp, I got a call from Oliver and he said, um, you know, I, I I was wondering if you would consider letting me use me in the book that I'm getting ready to publish. And I said, sure. I, I didn't have anything to hide. And he said, good, because you're chapter one and it's coming out in the New Yorker magazine in July of this year. I'm like, okay, we're a little ahead of ourselves here. Yeah. And what's the name of that book? The book is called Musicophilia. Okay. Um, that Oliver Sacks wrote, Musicophilia. Um, it's actually Musicophilia, Tales of Music and the Brain is the full title. And so, you know, I said, sure. And then, you know, then he said, oh, well, it's it's going to be coming out very shortly. And, and sure enough, it came out in July of 2007. And all of a sudden, you know, there, there was a lot of interest. The phone started ringing off the hook. And one of the calls, I, first calls I got was from a friend of mine um, at the State University of New York, um, Carlton Clay. And Carlton you know, was the head of the music department at the State University there. And he said, you know, I was wondering if, you know, I've seen this article in the New Yorker and I was wondering if you would teach a class. And I thought, well, that would be interesting. And so I agreed to that. And a week later, he calls and he says, you know, awful lot of interest in this. 
he said, would you consider playing for the class? And I said, sure. And then a couple of weeks after that, he calls back again and he says, he said, you know, it's really grown more than I've ever expected it. And he said, would you consider doing a, a concert at the Performing Arts Center? And I said, I've never done that before. I don't have the faintest idea, and I wouldn't even know where to start. And he says, it'll be fine. <laughs> he lied. <laughs> so I'm thinking back on your dream now. Is that what's what we're yeah. coming full circle here? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I, you know, after after several phone calls of calling me back and back, I agreed to do it, and then. It was seemed like it was another two weeks later. He calls back and he says, "I just want to let you know that, in addition to the the concert, there's going to be three television crews there." And I said, "I said you got to be kidding me." He said, "No, the BBC One, Granada Media, and German Television are all going to be there." And I was panicked. And I, I, you know, I called my piano teacher and told her what was going on. And I said, "Is there any way you can get me through this?" And she, she said, "But it's going to take a lot of work." And so at that point, we spent the next two months. And we would work three or four hours a day. She would take me up there, make me walk out onto the stage, make me walk off the stage. Make me go through the music, and she would go up in the in the top of the auditorium, and she go, "I can't hear you." <laughs> so you know, it was it was a huge learning experience, and and I thought, I don't know how I'll ever get through this, but and I remember going to the green room the mor the morning of it, and I remember saying to to God and whoever else would listen, I said, "You you put me in this mess." I said, don't leave me out there and embarrass us both. And, and obviously, I didn't make it as a demand. I said, please, don't do that. And I managed to get through it without screwing it up. And uh, and at that point, it, um, it took on a life of its own. You know, the music then became, there was a, lo a lot of, People that wanted to to hear it, and it was recorded, and I would play all over the place um, at different different uh, performance places. Okay, I think at this point, let's put some of this piece of music in now. Okay, so your your life was changed in a big way as far as musically. Did did your experience change your life in other ways too? Yeah, it sure did. Um, and a lot of things. When after the lightning, and and the music became a powerful presence in my life, I was absolutely obsessed. I, I got up at 4.30 every morning. I played piano until 6.30 when I had to go to work. I would work my 12 hours. I would come home, and I would have dinner, you know, if if there was still anything left, and I would get the kids ready for bed, um, and that was, you know, part of my staying connected to them. And then I was back at the piano from then until usually twelve, one o'clock in the morning, and I, I would I would be working on the piano till I couldn't even see straight, and and then I would go to bed and get up at four thirty, five o'clock and start all over again. It didn't do anything for my marriage, I can tell you that. So we wound up getting divorced as a result of all of that, and and I certainly kind of expect that and you can't expect somebody to be completely abandoned for a piano and like it 
so we get wound up getting divorced. But our our focus had always been trying to create the most stable environment for the kids. After we got divorced, my my ex wife was living in the garage over the house, um, so we had a free sta- a standing garage next to the house, and we had made an apartment for her over there so she could stay connected to the kids and and this went on for for many years after about eight years we got remarried again um because you know a lot of people said we never really got divorced you know in in truthfulness um and by that time i had learned some moderation um with the piano and the music and 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 could function uh, almost like a norm, normal adult um, without being constantly obsessing about it. Uh, so that that was one of the big trade-offs. And then the other thing was is when I was in when I was working in my practice, I was I was really headed down this academic road, if you will. I was I was doing research. I was publishing. I was the chairman of a big spine meeting um, that met yearly, and you know all of that stuff was was going great up until the lightning. And after the lightning, I realized that that was absolutely meaningless. And so I abandoned that whole aspect of things. And you know, people became much more of a focus. Um, in in terms of my practice, um, than than at any other time, so it, it really became a much more personal uh, endeavor. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, I most people that have had a profound experience like this undergo some kinds of major changes in their life. Um, a lot of people that have had near-death experiences end up experiencing divorce afterwards. You've had quite a few years post this experience now. Can you tell us anything about that? Not not just what happened to you, but what you've learned about other people in that way. You know, I have learned that there's so much more that we don't understand. Um, having... Having had the experience of of being out of my body and seeing that there is something more than what meets the eye, and I know that our spirit lives on forever. Our spirit is eternal. You know, I I, I was brought up Catholic, but I, I have not been able to reconcile the religious aspects of what I was taught with with what I experienced in real time. And so, you know, I had I have become much more spiritual but less religious, if that makes sense. Um, and I'm I absolutely am certain of of what happens. Um, you know, it I know that we continue on. Um and I've 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 read literally hundreds of books of people who have had near death experiences and and try to compare notes and and have read lots of books about you know where do we come from where are we going um, from our our soul natures you know there's a a lot that's 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 ongoing I'm I'm actually in the process of trying to write a book about that and, you know, taking my, what I experienced in my near death experience and, and what I have been reading about, you know, the origin of our souls and, and, you know, where we come from, where are we going? How does it all fit together? So that's, that's kind of the, the, the book that I'm going to write is, is, following those lines. So hopefully that'll come to fruition in the next year. That's great. Before we sign off here, I love to leave people with some kind of a message of hope in a world that sometimes is a little tough right now. But any last thoughts for everybody? 
absolutely know that you are loved and that love is eternal and that you are eternal when you when you die you continue on and what happens after that i'm not entirely sure of um other than the fact that we live on tony thank you so much for being here today oh absolutely my pleasure thank you for having me here Thanks for listening. We hope you will share this message with family and friends. To be notified when the next episode goes live, follow this show on your podcasting app or click over to roundtripdeath.com and sign up for our email newsletter. As always, if you've had a near-death experience and want to share it, shoot an email to eric at roundtripdeath.com. Until then, I wish you everything good that you're looking for in this life and the next. Music